welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Jen Cobray. Anyway, I'm going to get down on my knees and pray because I need God. Who said amen? Get out of here. What are you talking about? Uh, now, if I, if I need God, you need God too. Is that not true? So uh, well, let me try that again. And say, I'll say, I need God. Then you say, me too. Oh, wait a minute. I need God. Oh, that makes me feel so much better. We're in this together. You know that. It's, I have so much fun with the word of God because uh, I, I'm, I'm anointed to preach. But I'm not anointed to keep any more than you are. You know what that means? I got to work at it just like you do. Because I preach it doesn't mean it comes automatically. I have to work at it. And so I'm going to get down on my knees and pray. I need God. Stand to your feet. Let's put our hearts before the Lord. Father, we just thank you for this time that we can gather together and be in the house of God and hear the word of the Lord. And we're just grateful, Father, for what you're doing in lives of people, other people as well as ourselves. Here's our heart. Fill it with your way, your word. Fill it with your love, your mercy, your grace. Uh, just build us, strengthen us, encourage us, guide us, guard us. And God will give you the praise, give you the glory. Lord, we're fully aware that the teacher of the church is not a man, not a woman, not a young man, old man, not a tall man, short man, not a black man, brown man, not a, a, a white man. But God, the teacher of the church is the Holy Spirit. We have come in the house of God to hear from the Holy Spirit. So fill our hearts with your ways. And as we get blessed, we will be a blessing to others. As we get blessed, we'll give you the praise and give you the glory, give you the honor. Bless all the churches in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet that are preaching and hearing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ today and all this time, this week, and Lord, wherever they're at. If they're preaching the gospel or there are brothers and sisters, or we want you to make them successful and prosperous in every area so the gospel can go out all over this planet telling people that are lost and dying about the good news of Jesus Christ. And God will give you the praise in Jesus' mighty name with a great big shout we all say amen. amen. Well, go ahead, take your seat, get your Bible. Go with me, if you will, into Hebrews, the seventh chapter. We're going into verse number 25. It's a really cool verse. It's got such great things to say about you. Now, wait a minute. Did you just hear what I said? It's got great things to say about you and me as we look at the word of the Lord today. This is not written as a history lesson. In fact, as we go to the word of God, it actually tells us about how to live life, how to do life, how to run your business, how to have a great marriage, how to take care of your children, how to provide for your family. What is this all about called life? Have you ever stopped and thought about what in the world are you doing on this planet? Why are you even here? What is the purpose of this? Why are you here? I mean, you stop and think about it just for a moment. You were born naked, didn't have a flippin' thing to your name. And then when you die, you ain't taking one thing with you. So that ought to give you an indication that what's on this planet isn't about the things that you accumulate or the way that you live your life in the world, but it's all about how you deal with Jesus. At the end of your life, this is the only thing that's going to determine whether or not you have eternal life with Jesus is whether or not you deal with the things of God in your life the right way or you don't deal with them. That's what this is all about. The purpose of your existence is a relationship with Jesus, whether you have it or don't have it, and how deep and meaningful it becomes. A lot of times people don't understand that. So in order to have that happen, we go to the Word of God, the B-I-B-L-E, not find out what a man says. Because, I, you know, like you, I don't give lip what men say. Who could care less about what men say? I'm sick and tired, quite frankly, of your opinions. You're tired of people's opinions like I am. I don't care what the politicians say to us. Uh, one year they say one thing, next year they say something completely different as if nobody remembers. And it's like, who cares? You know, what we need to find out is what's eternal that lasts forever, never changes, and is a truth that I can base my life on, and it's the Bible. 
And as I find the Word of God and apply it in my life, things start to change. I've got a future, I've got a hope, I've got a destiny, I've got a purpose. So what we do is we go to the Word of God, line upon line, precept upon precept. What does that mean, line upon line? In other words, God wrote it that way. You ought to be able to understand it that way. I don't want you to come into the house of God and all of a sudden, whatever the preacher thinks you ought to hear, he says, let's find out what God says. He wrote it that way. we got to go for everything, the tough stuff as well as the easy stuff, the big stuff as well as the little stuff. We can't just preach our favorite messages. we got to find out because, listen, when you get into the Word of God, the Bible, you find out how to do life. But you find out how to do life, not only learning the Word of God, but learning the very character, nature, and attributes of who God is. Because I can learn how to memorize the scripture, do me no good at all, until I find out the very character of God, the attributes of God that's behind the Word of God. And then I put it together with a knowledge of the Word of God. And all of a sudden, I've got a pattern for my life to live in order to be successful. And you know darn well every single one of you want to be successful. In order to be successful in your future, you're going to have to find out what the Word of the Lord has to say. Is anybody listening? That's why we go line upon line, precept upon precept, and Word of God. Now, here we are in Hebrews 7, chapter verse number 25, and we're going to be talking about a wonderful subject. Before I take you to the verse 25, let me give you a title if you're making notes of today's message. Jesus, our intercessor. A lot of people don't understand what that means and how good it is, but how about this? Listen, before I go any further, let me just say this to you. If you listen today, did you know how I said the word if? If you listen today, you'll walk out of here. Here's a promise from me to you. You'll walk out of this place today and you're going to go, Woo! I have got something that is good to hold on to for the rest of my life. That's how good this verse is. It's full of power, full of interesting facts, literally about Jesus, but about you too. So I want you not to daydream. I want you to listen closely because God's got something mighty to say to you. Let's take a look at it, Hebrews, the seventh chapter, verse number 25. Verse number 25 starts off with, therefore, remember we're talking about the high priest. And all of a sudden we talk about Melchizedek and how much better Jesus is as a high priest. Why? Because he's eternal. Melchizedek died off. He, you know, somewhere along the line, all the Aaronic, if you will, and all the uh, Levitical priesthood, they all died eventually, and someone else could took their place. But Jesus doesn't. He's eternal. He's in the heavens, seated at the right hand of the Father. I mean, if you're going to have a high priest, the one to have is Jesus. And the reason you want to have Jesus is because he's there all the time. He's not going anywhere. He's not here today and gone to Maui. He's not taking a vacation. He's not off doing something weird. He's there with you. He's there for me. He's the high priest who knows how you feel. Let me tell you something. High priests in the flesh knew about the flesh but didn't know about the spirit. Here's Jesus. It's all God and all man. Comes to earth, experiences the man experience so he can go before the high courts of heaven and be your intercessor. One who's going to make petitions for you. Who is going to plead before the high courts of heaven on your behalf. And as we understand this, it's an amazing analogy that takes place. So the word therefore is a big word. Notice the capital H and the word he afterwards, speaking of God, speaking of Jesus, is also able to save to the uttermost. Stop right there. Stop thinking about it. If I never went anywhere, but just this, this is powerful today. He's able to save to the uttermost. Did you know you had a lot of people come along and save you from situations? You know, saved at the bell. Your aunt came along, sent you a check that helped you to pay your bills. Whew, you got to pay your bills. Wow, she sure saved my, my, my boat. Or your uncle came along or a friend came along or someone saved you, someone rescued you, someone did something, but they could never get you to the uttermost. There's only one that gets you to the uttermost. His name is Jesus. The uttermost means heaven. That means eternal life. Can I tell you something? The plan has been done. It's been fulfilled. You have accomplished. You've won the race. You're in heaven with Jesus. And Jesus can do something. He saves you to the uttermost. He doesn't take you halfway. Doesn't take you a quarter of the way. Doesn't take you two-thirds of the way. Doesn't take you partially the way and give up on you. You've had people give up on you all the time in your life. But I got one. Guess what? His name is Jesus. And he'll take you all the way to the uttermost. 
I get a little Pentecostal on you when I get there, don't I? And it's just hard to be, you know, like, can you imagine me saying this like this? Like, uh, uh, he said to the other boat, I, I, I got to get excited about this stuff, you know? And so here he is, Jesus. And he saves those who come to God through him. And I want you to hear that because maybe some of you haven't come to God yet. You know who he is and you know him in your head. You celebrate Easter and Christmas. You haven't any problem with him. But you haven't yet come to him the right way in order to be part of his family. We'll take care of that in a little bit, but it's so important. Since he always lived... Oh, wait a minute. I'm going to read this to you. I want you to get it. This is so powerful, you've got to get this all about you. Since he always lives, always lives... I'm going to say it again. I don't know if you got it or not. Since he always lives... Did, did you get that? No, I don't think so. Maybe this I'll get. Since, you, since he always lives. You know, a lot of us live for things. I live for Debbie. I live for my kids and grandkids. I live to preach the gospel. I live to serve the Lord while I'm here on this planet. We have all reasons to live. But did you ever think about why Jesus lives? Did you hear what I said? Have you ever thought about why Jesus lives? What's he all about? Did you know that he's all about standing in the gap for you? He exists always to stand in the gap for you. Notice what it says, since he always lives to make intercession. Intercession's a weird word. We don't use it very often. Like, we don't walk along and say, hey, how's your intercession today? We just don't talk about the word intercession. The word is a word we understand. Most of us just relate it with uh, getting involved or praying or something like that. But it's a really great meaning in Scripture. Can I share it with you? In other words, he always lives to make intercession for them that are saved in his. Can you imagine such a thing? That's his goal. That's his plan. That's what his purpose is. That's what he does. But here's what intercession is all about. Are you ready? Intercession, the act of interceding by pleading or praying in behalf of you. Can you imagine that Jesus lives to plead on your behalf before the high courts of heaven? You talk about having an advocate. You talk about having a, an attorney. Can I tell you something? I've had a lot of attorneys in my life, and they're wonderful. And, you know, you've heard all the attorney jokes and all that kind of stuff. I'm not here to do that. That's not right. But let me just share something with you. There are earthly attorneys, sorry, attorneys, but there are godly attorneys. His name is Jesus, and he stands before the high courts of heaven, and he pleads your case. I, I must have been talking to somebody else. Let me try that again because I didn't get any response. It's like, hello. Let, let me try it all over again. And he stands before the high courts of heaven and he pleads your case. I mean, stop and think about that. Can I ask you something? You've had attorneys that plead a lot of times for your case and, be, and they don't win, but I want you to know something. Can you tell me one case that God doesn't win? When God asks, when God pleads before the high courts of heaven, he says, Father, and my, uh, they belong to me. They're covered by my blood. They've been washed from their sins. They belong to me, Lord. Oh, my goodness, that's an interceder. And what is it that Jesus asks that he doesn't get an answer to? Ever thought about that? Can you imagine him going before the heavens and saying, Father? And Father looks at him and says, Nah, I'm not going to do that. Anyway, who cares? Forget it. No, the answer is no. Stop being a brat. No. <laughs> it just isn't going to happen. When Jesus asks for something, it's going to get done. I mean, that's my advocate. I don't know what kind you have, but that's my advocate. Is anybody listening? And he stands and he lives to make intercession for us. He pleads on my behalf. Now, wait a minute. Why does he have to do that? Because I'm a screw up, number one. And so are you. You know it's true. 
And, and number two, can I tell you this? I've got an enemy that likes to plead before the high courts of heaven and saying I'm no good. Did he not do it with Simon? Yes, Peter. Did he not go before the high courts of heaven with Job? Did he not go before the high courts of heaven about Jesus? Did he not get Jesus after 40 days of, of not eating and fasting and come against Jesus? Let me tell you something. If he'll come against Jesus, what a stupid person. Luckily, he's not a person, but what a stupid spirit. If he'll come against uh, Jesus, he'll come against you. And when he comes against me and he comes against you, we've got an advocate in heaven. His name is Jesus. And he says, man, they belong to me. Come on, somebody. <laughs> I love it. Man, if God can be for you, the Bible makes it very clear, who can be against you? In other words, like, what do we worry about these people that come against us all the time when we've got God on our side? And we put too much, I like what Romans 8 chapter, listen, I'll pop it up on the overhead for you, uh, verse number 34. Romans 8 chapter, verse 34, watch this. Who is he who condemns? Wait a minute, I don't know if you, you get this. Who is he that condemns? See, there's always going to be one that's going to criticize, judge you, and condemn you. There's always be someone who says, they don't meet up, they don't match, they're not worthy. There's always, the, uh, I mean, who is he that condemns? In other words, if God be for you, who can be against you? Who is he that condemns? It's Christ that died and furthermore has also risen. Who even into the right hand of the God, who also makes, oh, pleadings on our behalf and lives to do that. I find people who live to do something do it better than anybody else that just tries to do it. Is anybody, <laughs> anybody get that? I'm not repeating it. And so it's an amazing thing that you and I, in our times of trials and pressures, times even of good times, Times of frustration, times of messing up, times of making mistakes, times of insecurities that we often have. We've got someone on our side, God Almighty, who lives to plead our benefits. Can you imagine that? Every day you need to remember that Jesus is at the right hand of the Father, talking to the Father about you. And how great you are and how wonderful you are. And his blood has washed you and it's okay, it's going to get done. Man, I tell you, I'm glad I've got an advocate in heaven that takes care of me. Five quick things Jesus gave me about things that he intercedes for. Five things that Jesus intercedes for. These five things, if you'll remember them, they'll make you happy. <laughs> They're good things. Five things that Jesus, quick, I'm going to go quickly through these, that Jesus interceded for. I figure if Jesus interceded for them, then there's going to be results in them. And if Jesus interceded for them and us, there's going to be results in us. But I need to know that so that when I mess up in some area of my life, I can eh, go back and remember that the Word of God said to me. Five things. I like this. Number one, a sin-free life. Doesn't mean I'm not going to sin. I didn't say you won't sin. But did you know what I mean by sin-free life means if I sin, I've got an advocate in the heavens that's there to wash me and forgive me and cleanse me according to 1 John 1, 9. But i got to be willing to go to God when I sin because, listen to me, can I just say this to you? There's... there's can you tell me the truth? Has anybody ever sinned since they've been saved? Five of you. The rest will pray for you after church because you have a lying spirit on you. All of us have messed up after we were saved. But we thank God we've got an advocate in heaven who cares about us that makes sure that he's praying for us. And if we sin, guess what? He doesn't want us to continue to sin, so he's praying that we not continue in our sin. And here's how sin works. You'll sin and you won't like it. And then you'll say, I'm never going to do it again. Then you'll do it again. 
and you won't like it. And then you'll say, I'm never going to do that again. I hate that. God help me. And then you sin again. And eventually you'll get to the place where you're strong enough that you're not sinning at all. Take some time. And in the meantime, he's interceding for you, pleading the high courts of heaven for you. <laughs> That's good news. Hundreds of years before Jesus was born, a prophet by the name of Isaiah was speaking in the land, and as he spoke, he spoke of the Messiah, Jesus. And he writes these words that are just fascinating as can be. If you'll go there with me in Isaiah, the book of Isaiah, the 53rd chapter, verse number 32. I'm sorry, the 53rd chapter, verse number 12. Did I say 32? Sorry, I don't know where the 32 came from. But it's a good place to turn. Go ahead and go there. No, no. <laughs> Isaiah 52, verse 12. Therefore, it says, I will divide him. Notice the capital H in the word him. Speaking of God. I will divide him a portion with the great. You ever wondered who the great? You know, I know, you never have. Did you know, I, I personally believe that word great up there is you. I will divide him a portion. Did you know that Romans, the eighth chapter says, you are heirs and joint heirs with Jesus. In other words, in other words everything Jesus has belongs to you. <laughs> oh my goodness. And so he says, I will divide him, and remember this is prophetic, a portion with the great. And he will divide the spoils with the strong. Who's the strong? I believe it's you and me that hang in there with Jesus to the end. And everything he has, according to Romans 8 chapter, is mine. I'm heir and joint heir with Jesus. Because he poured out his soul onto death. Next part of the verse. And he was numbered with the transgressors. Don't you know he was? Went to the cross, took on the sins of mankind. And he bore the sins of many there at that cross. This is all, by the way, hundreds of years before Jesus ever shared and walked on this planet. Wow. And made intercession for the transgressors. And to this day, he lives to make intercession for you and I. To stand in the gap and plead your case before the high courts of heaven. Woo! <laughs> That's pretty exciting. Then the gavel comes down, bang! Innocent because of the blood of the Lord Jesus. That is amazing. That's worth a shout in the house. Innocent because of the blood of the Lord. You may not feel innocent. Of course not. Because your intercessor's there, he pronounces it innocent. That's pretty exciting. So here he is taking care of us. Well, number two, we're talking about five quick things that Jesus interceded for. A stable life. I don't know about you, but I need stability all the time. And I find that when whoever holds me causes me to be stable. In other words, if I'm held in place by the stability of someone or something that is strong, that keeps me from falling away. It keeps me from failing. It keeps me from going in the wrong direction. In other words, what holds me in that stable position? I, I get on a horse and not be very stable because there's only a saddle between my legs and a horse jumping up and down underneath the saddle. But if you wrap a rope around me and tie me onto the horse and the saddle, oh, please don't do that. Uh, but if you did, I would be stable in that place because something held me in that place. Something kept me from falling off. And I find that where stability is, stability doesn't come from the stuff you have. Stability comes from he that you put your trust in. And that's what Jesus is all about. And he intercedes for a stable, solid life. I found this in John the 17th chapter. In John the 17th chapter, go there with me in verse number 9. He says, and I pray for them. I do not, verse number 9, and I do not pray for the world, but for those of whom you have given me, for they are yours. 
And all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. He's talking about his disciples, and you and I are part of that, by the way. And now I'm no longer in the world, and these are in the world, and I have come to you, Holy Father. And listen to this. I have come to you, Holy Father. What's he going to do? He's praying. And don't let me, let me say this to you. When Jesus prays, he gets answers. And he says, I have come to you, Holy Father. Keep through your name those whom you have given me. Man, we are kept because Jesus prayed for us. And every demon in hell, every devil can come, every economic condition can try to stop us. But let me tell you something. When we fall, we fall forward and we get up and we keep on going because we have an advocate in heaven. I love that. That he makes that kind of a prayer. Verse number 12, it says, While they were with me in the world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me, I have kept. He is used to keeping you. Verse number 15, jump down to verse 15. I do not pray for you that you should uh, take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from, keep them from, keep them from the evil one. My goodness. Let me tell you something. He can't touch you. And you know something? Listen to me now. You are a kept girl. And you are a kept boy. That's right. You are kept. And God's keeping you. Can you imagine the one that holds it all together? by the power of his word, holds it all together. The moon at its right distance, the sun at its right distance, or we would burn up. Can you imagine the one who speaks and the stars are flung into the heavens? Can you imagine the one who created all things? He is the one, the one power force that can keep you. I mean, listen, you can be kept by a lot of things that have failed in this world. You can be kept by a man who ran off. You can be kept by a woman who ran off. You kept by a promise of a bank that failed. You can be kept by a government that failed. You can be kept by a lot of things. But when God keeps you, there's no failure behind it. In order for you to fail, God would have to fail. Come on, somebody. (laughs) Every day, I'm a kept man. Isn't that good news? Which brings us to number three. Number three, I like this. Help. He intercedes for our help. I don't know about you, but I need help. Remember, I need help. And you're supposed to say, me too. Let's try that again. I need help. We're all in this together. We need help. I need the help of God at every turn of the road. I need a help with my family. I need a help on my job. I need a help economically. I need the favor of God. I need the God to come through for me. And God's there praying for help for me. And I love what he says. Listen closely to the word of God. John 14 chapter. You are already there in John the, the 17 chapter. Just flip back just a little bit. In John the 14th chapter. In John 14 chapter verse 14 he makes this statement. He says ask anything in my name and I will do it for you. I like that verse. Let me say it again. <laughs> Some of you aren't paying attention. You need to get excited about that verse. You can't get excited about anything else today. Get excited about that verse. That verse is pretty cool. You can ask anything in my name and I will do it. Oh, yes. Do I have to read any more of the Bible? Do I have to? That's all I need to know. Oh, my goodness. That's a good one. But then he comes along with the next verse, which says, oh, my goodness, perimeters to that question. But if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. In other words, there's a responsibility in all of our part to do what we need to do, even though at times we don't feel like doing what we need to do. Mm-hmm. Listen closely, and then verse number 16 comes along. I'll pray the Father, and he will give you another helper. I need help. Jesus says he's going out. Please, Jesus, don't go. Don't go. I need you. He says, okay, I'll send you help. The Holy Spirit. And he will abide with you for how long? Forever. Not going here. Have you ever had people say, I'll help you. They're here today and gone to Maui. It's like, why? 
You were here today and now you're gone. What's that all about? But here's one that says, I'll be with you forever. And listen to the next verse. He says, the spirit of truth in whom the world cannot receive because he, they neither see him nor know him, but you know him. And he will del- dwell with you and, and will be in you. The other day I was away from Deborah at supper time. I came in about 8.30 that night, quarter to nine. Deborah says, you want me to make you dinner? And I, I said, no, I already ate. She said, where'd you eat? I said, I went to a restaurant. And I told her the name of the restaurant. She says, you went to the restaurant? And she says, and you, and, and, and you sat there by yourself? I said, yeah. <laughs> Weren't you feeling funny being by yourself? <laughs> uh, girls are kind of weird, you know what I mean? They're just kind of weird, you know? She said, no, nah, I wouldn't feel funny. I said, I used to go to movies by myself before I met you. And she said, you did? Of course I went to movies by myself, and I ate by myself tonight. And she says, didn't you think people were staring at you? (laughs) No. (laughs) See, the truth is, none of us are ever alone. I mean, the bottom line, you may not have any place to go with Thanksgiving. Can I tell you something? Go have a Thanksgiving meal. God's going with you. Come on. You're never alone. You've got a helper with you. Are you following me? You ought to be the happiest people in the world. you got a helper, not a complainer, not a grumbler. So many times we, follow, we, we fill our lives with people who complain and grumble. Well, they're all around us all the time. Oh, yes, but I'm not alone. You wish you were alone. But you got the Holy Spirit living on the inside of you. Guess what? And and not complaining. He's talking about Jesus. He's leading you and directing you. He's there to build you up and strengthen you. He's there to encourage you and help you at every turn of the road. (laughs) Woo! He prayed that we'd have a Holy Spirit. Man, you got saved. You got the Holy Spirit living on the inside of you. Number four. Five things quickly that Jesus prayed about. I love this one. Our faith. Our faith at times can get weary and give up. No, wait a minute. I'm going to say it again. Our faith at times. Sometimes people think our faith can never give weary and never give up. You know, when you pray about something for a long period of time, you don't get answers how you give up. And how you just say, oh, I must have missed God, or it didn't happen, or God doesn't care, I don't understand, everybody else gets blessed, they get their answers to prayer, I don't get an answer to prayer, I don't know what's going on, oh my goodness, God, ah, 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 ah. just complain all the time, but God, oh, I don't understand. And and so all of a sudden our faith isn't like it used to be. Did you know that God is interceding for you that your faith remains strong to this adventure of life. Because he that endures to the end shall be saved. He does not, this this is not a little sprint. This is a marathon race that you keep on keeping on, 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 keeping on. And God says, now you're doing it. See, I'm telling you, we're all confronted with everything that wants to stop our faith. You ever stop, thought about Peter or Simon? His name was Simon, you know, and this changed to Peter. And, and he's, the, he's the guy who said, Jesus, I'll never deny you. And Jesus looks at him and said, man, before the cock crow, crows, what was it, three times, you will deny me. He said, I'm not going to do it. I go to the rock church. <laughs> you know, and they come up to they come up to Peter. Aren't you the guy that was with that guy that we're stringing up over there on the? Aren't you used to travel with him? Not me, man. I was out there surfing all week. What are you talking about? <laughs> come on, denied him and denied him and denied him, and Jesus knew it. 
And I love the Word of God because the Word of God is so clear. I, I just want you to look at it with me. Notice this in Luke 22. I'll pop it up on the overhead Sorry, verse number 31. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked for you. Stop right there. I should have, in the back room, John, I don't know if you can do this, highlighted Satan has asked for you. Did you know, my friends, Satan has asked for you? If he can ask for Job, and if he can ask for Jesus, and if he can ask for Peter, don't think he hasn't asked for you. The difference is, is you now have an advocate in the high courts of heaven who intercedes for you and says, no way. They belong to me and are washed by me. <laughs> Satan has asked for you that he may sift you like wheat. That's what he wants to do in your life. Some of you feel like you've been sifted by wheat. You need to run back to Jesus. Listen to the connection. Next verse. But I have prayed, oh, there to that intercession, for you, that your faith should not fail. It might get off track for a little bit. I might get a little weary at times. I don't know how this is going to all play out or work out, but my faith's not going to fail. Notice what Jesus says to Peter. And when you have returned to me, here's how your faith doesn't fail. When you get back on faith and return to Jesus. Hey, listen, there's some problems. There's some trials. There's some pressures. Things do not work out the way you always want them to work out. Because you're a Christian doesn't mean you're in a bubble and there's never problems that you have to face. And sometimes your faith will get a bit weary, uh, get a little bit off track. But here's the answer to that. Get back to Jesus. And when you do, you'll be so strong then you can strengthen others. That's what he finishes the verse saying. My, it's just so good that he prays like he did with Peter. You don't think he's praying for you? He didn't pray for you while your faith is shaken over your business? Pray for you while your faith is shaken over your marriage? Pray for you while, you know, the kids are shaken and you're, you're not sure about how it's going to work? When you're shaking a little bit over your job or the economics of the housing market or the real estate market or who the heck you could put your trust in nowadays? Can I tell you something? It was never designed for you to put your trust in the government. Never designed for you to put your trust in, 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 in a teacher or in a sergeant in the army or the military. It was only you have built into your own personal DNA to put your trust in Jesus. That's what you were made for. And when your trust goes somewhere else other than Jesus, you will always be weary. But there's an intercessor praying that your faith would be strengthened and you'd get back to Jesus. Ooh. Last one for today. He prays, there's five quick things and here they are. He prays those that are away from Jesus. He loves to pray for the lost. No matter how bad they are, no matter how they've screwed up, no matter how bad the situation is, Jesus, I, if you know people, and I do, I'm telling you something, I know people that, that anger me so much over God that I make statements that are so stupid, I say, boy, I hope they enjoy hell. <laughs> In fact, the real honest truth to you, can I be honest with you? I have said, it's going to give me pleasure to see them go to hell. And God will correct me immediately because God is praying over every lost soul. You see, it's not what's been done in the past that counts with God. It's what's in the future. And the future is when you're washed by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Come on, somebody. 
Jesus, a beaten, bloody mess, dragged through the streets of Jerusalem, dragging that cross, nailed to the cross, brutally, everything pouring out of him. And he looks up to heaven and he says, Father, forgive them for they know, they know not what they do. That's Jesus praying for them. When I make a mistake, he says, Father, even though he's the senior pastor of that great church, spiritual leader in the town, forgive him, for he knows not what he does. He's just stupid. I'm not sure he says the just stupid part. But I wouldn't blame him if he did. Knows not what he does. Sometimes we make all kinds of mistakes. And some people are so far away from God that he's praying for you to come home because there's no other life except the life that you'll find in Jesus. And you've, you know, you've looked everywhere else. You've tried really hard to find it. You've tasted everything. You've gone everywhere. You've done all you know how to do to find that peace and find that joy and find that fulfillment in life. And life doesn't have it to offer without Jesus. And he's interceding for you. Today in this house, we've learned that he intercedes for these five areas of our life that are so good for us. Could you just put up these five things? Number one, a sin-free life, a stable life, our help, our faith, and those that are away from Jesus. But I want to just share with you now, if you go back to Hebrews, the seventh chapter, verse 25, the verse now becomes alive to you. He lives always to make intercession for them that are his. Is that an amazing verse about you? and your God. Now, every, every person in here, I want to talk to you. Some of you need to know that right now, Jesus is calling you to make a decision. Listen to the verse again. Just pop it up, if you will. He's interceding. Save to the uttermost. Who does he save to the uttermost? Those who come to God through him. You don't get saved because you're an American. You don't get saved because you're pretty or nice, smart or talented or gifted, or rich or educated. You get saved because you come to God through Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. This is your moment right now. Listen to me. Jesus said, there's no other way to get to heaven. You must be born again. Most people in American churches don't even know what born again means. Let me explain what it means. It means you've given God all of your heart. It means you've given God all of your life. It is an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. Are you listening? Are you listening? All or nothing. God forgive us in American churches that we've watered that down. There's an interceder, there's an advocate on your side that wants to give you life to the fullest. But you have to give him all of your heart. You have to give him all of your life. It's an all or nothing relationship. You can't remain lukewarm anymore according to the book of Revelation. You are either going to get him in or you're going to be out. You're either going to be hot or you're going to be cold. There's no such thing as mediocrity or mediocre Christianity. It's all or nothing with Jesus. Always has been. And today, it's your day of salvation. He's praying for you right now to come home to Jesus and give him all of your heart and all of your life. And I will lead you. We'll lead you in a prayer that will... Invite Jesus to come into your heart. Jesus doesn't come into your heart because you need him. He went to the cross because you need him. He comes into your heart because you in 
invite him. Will you do that today? Before we go any further, I'm speaking to you. You have not given God all of your heart. You have not given God all of your life. You do know who he is. You don't have a problem with that. You celebrate Easter, you celebrate Christmas. But you haven't given him all of your heart and you haven't given him all of your life. Head knowledge will not get you to heaven. Even the devil knows who he is, but he's not going to heaven. It's not what you've done. Look at me, look at me, look at me with your head. It's what you've done with your heart. And today it's your day of salvation. All across this auditorium, if you want us to pray with you, I will not embarrass you. But if you are embarrassed, too bad. Get over it. It's okay. It's better to be embarrassed for a moment in a safe church like this than to be in hell forever and ever and ever and ever because you care more about what people think and see instead of what God thinks and sees. In a moment, I want you to get ready to raise your hand if you're saying to yourself, I'm not sure. I need to make Jesus Lord and Savior of my life. Who should raise their hand if you've been running from God instead of to God? I'm speaking to you. If you've never given him all of your heart, never given him all of your life, I'm speaking to you. If you're one of those people that are in here and you're not sure, my goodness sakes alive, make sure. Maybe you prayed with Billy Graham or prayed at a harvest crusade. Good, but did you really give him all of your heart or did you just follow some formula prayer? like some magical abracadabra words that you said called a prayer? Because God doesn't hear the words. He watches your life that follows your heart to see if your words are real. And today is your day to give him all of your heart and all of your life. Today God brought you here because today is a divine appointment for you. All across this auditorium, back in the family rooms that are full, in the foyer, down by the Love Rock Cafe, put your hamburger down, I'm talking to you. Today is your day to get right with God. God's watching you right where you're at. Here's what I want you to do. I'm going to count to three. You know why? Because Jesus said, if you'll confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. I'm a man, I'll see your hand go up, I'll count to three, I'll go like this, one, two, three, and I'll go bang, when you hear that sound, bang, your hand goes up. I'll see it, what you're saying is I need Jesus, I need to give him all of my heart, give him all of my life, I need to be born again. I want to go to heaven, I don't want to go to hell. I'll see your hand. He says, if you confess me before men, I'm a man, I'll see it. He says, I'll confess you as mine before my Father, but if you deny me, I'll deny you. It's your call. I've done my job. We've had a great time. We've laughed. We've sung. We've clapped. We've enjoyed the Word of God. You got something from God. Now today, it's your call. Sit there and do nothing. Or get right with God because you know it's the thing to do. And you know it's right that you should. I'm counting to three. Here it goes. Your call. One. Two. Three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. Thank you. There's one. Thank you. There's two. Thank you. God bless you. There's three. Thank you. There's four. Thank you. There's five. There's six. Thank you. Seven. Eight. Thank you. Back over here. There's nine. Thank you. God bless you. There's another one. Where are you? You're pointing at something. Up. Nine. Over on this side. There's ten. God bless you. Going for God. There's eleven. God bless you. There's twelve. Back over here. Anybody else? Anybody else? There's thirteen. I see you right there. God bless you. Anybody else? There's 14, 15, 16. I think I already got you, but I'll count you twice. There's 17. Thank you. Anybody else? Anybody else? There's 18. Someone right back over there pointing to somebody. Anybody else? Real quick. If you're going for God, let's go. Thank you. I think I already counted you. There's 18. Where, where are you 19? 
You know you need to get your hand up, but you're not doing it, but you know you need to. Where are you? 19. Come on. Stop messing with God. God's speaking to you right now, and you know it. Anybody else? Anybody else? Where are you? 19. Thank you. There's 19. God bless you. Got two hands up. I don't blame you. I would too. I put two hands up in my leg at the same time if I had to go. If it meant me going to heaven. And then, and, and then hang my underwear on a flagpole if I had to get there. <laughs> Whatever it takes to get there. My goodness. There's 19. There's where, where, where are you? Where's anybody out? Over this way somewhere. Is it in the family room? Yeah, 20. Thank you. God bless you. Well, let's give the Lord a great big praise for 20 wise people. Isn't God good? All 20 of you, real quick, I, I don't want anybody to leave during this period of time. It's rude for you to leave. Church is not over yet. I want you to get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, friend, all 20 of you that raised your hand. Bring a friend if you need to bring a friend, if you're sitting next to somebody and they didn't raise their hand, but you want to make sure they're okay, ask them. Come on, I'll go with you. Just tell them you'll go, friend, I'll go with you. I want you to get out of your seat. In a moment, we'll all stand, get in the aisle, meet me right here. Bring your stuff, bring a friend. No one leaves during this period of time. Very rude for you to do. If you're in the family rooms, your children will remember this day, I promise you. Let them, be a witness to them. Bring them if they raise their hand. Get out of your seat. Ushers, help them out of the family rooms. Let's go get them. Let's stand and welcome these people as they come. You come right now. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. My chains are gone. I've been set free, my God, my Savior has ransomed me, and like a flood, come on home. His mercy reigns, come on amazing home. love, amazing grace, come on home. my chains are gone, I've been set free. My God, my Savior, has ransomed me. Come on, you come too. Come on home. Like a blood, his mercy come on home. Come on, come on, come on. Love, hurry, hurry, hurry. Thank God, good. Thank God you've come. Why don't you all take a moment and look over to your left. This is Pastor Joel. He's waving at you. He's the nicest guy in the whole world. No weird stuff goes on. Only weird when Pastor Dan preaches. So he's, uh, we're, we're cool today. So here, here's the deal. Pastor Joel is a good guy. He's going to do three things. Lead you in a prayer because you need to invite Jesus into your heart. Number two is going to give you some free stuff. I love the word free. Take it home, read about what you should do next. That's what it'll do. It'll answer the questions. Now, to, what does God want from me? Number three, and I love this part. Number three, he's going to encourage you to get back to church. We have a program that'll help you get strong called Spiritual Personal Trainers. They're behind you right now. They're friends. We're giving friends away. Hi, Marianne and Bernie. They've been friends for 20, probably 30 years. And uh, so they're just dear friends, and you're... You've got great spiritual personal trainers. Personal trainers, people meet you before church service and help you get strong in Jesus. Get involved and watch God change your life. Make a left turn, if you will, and follow Pastor Joel right over there. The people who came with, they'll wait for you. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow, you repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin 
and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Bye-bye.